let me uh, uh, um, let me just give you a, 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 an introduction here. It's, it's really, I still find this a really strange forum, so you'll forgive me for being kind of slightly odd about it. Um, what I was going to say, one of the great pleasures of being, and, and it is one of many pleasures of being the president of the Systematic Association, is I get to choose who gives the uh, president's lecture. And I was really delighted that Sam had agreed to um, give this, especially as she doesn't get to, to, to do it in the Linnaean Society room. She doesn't get a glass of wine afterwards and doesn't get all the other things which we usually give our, our speakers. So. We, we, we owe you um, and, and we will fix that at some point. Uh, the, the other main reason was that, that it would be impossible for me to try and summarise Sam's research. I'm, I'm just a diatomist, so the best I can do is summarise it is that she does studies on fossil fishes. That is probably completely um, uh, a complete understatement. The reason why I was interested in getting Sam here is because first I'm, I'm really interested in the fact that that we still learn things from uh, vertebrate bones. We still find ways of, of reinterpreting them. And as I've got here, we still find ways of treating them in relation to what we know or what we thought we knew. So something new can come from uh, uh, anatomy. Something new can come from paleontology. And that, that's really exciting, given that we're living in this genomics age. So I, I, I was really impressed in the, the, the content of the presentation that I've been to Sam's. Let me just give you a, a little bit about her, but really that it's the research work that matters, not all this other stuff. Um, the dangers of doing Google research is that they may be a bit out of date, but I've got here that she's presently at the University of Birmingham, um, a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow still, I assume that's still correct. And what I really like here is she's the academic keeper of the Latworth Museum of Geology. I love the fact that people still got keeper as a title. So with all those things, um, uh, I, well, apart from envy, what else what, what else could we want? Sam, it's all yours. Talk upon X-ray imaging meets paleontology. Fresh insights into the rise of ray thin fishing. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen and then I'll get the uh, presentation going. There we go. So hopefully you can uh, see that okay. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about um, my research uh, and how I combine x-ray imaging and paleontology to understand uh, the fish tree of life. Um, so vertebrates are an amazingly diverse and successful modern group. There are key features of their body plan that allow them to occupy almost any environment you can think of. So from the land to the deep sea and the skies to deep underground. But there are some really major obstacles to understanding how this hugely successful modern body plan arose. So firstly, their evolutionary roots stretch back over uh, nearly half a billion years. And secondly, most of the most informative aspects of their anatomy are internal. They're, they're tied up inside the animal and they're really hard to access using a lot of traditional techniques. And most crucially for my research, despite accounting for over half of vertebrate diversity and being of vast scientific, economic and ecological importance, the ray finned fishes and their fossils are critically understudied. So my research uses 3D X-ray imaging techniques uh, to remove these dual barriers of uh, deep time and inaccessible anatomy to get inside the heads of early vertebrates. Doing so allows me to resolve fundamental uh, questions relating to the origin and evolution of vertebrates and how life has kind of uh, evolved through the past uh, nearly 500 million years. Um, here are my acknowledgements so that I can end with my conclusions. I'd like to thank uh, particularly my funders on the left for supporting my work throughout my career so far, and also to all of the people on the, the right and many, many more for um, access to specimens, for collaborations, and for very helpful discussions and just supporting me. So almost all living vertebrates, vertebrates are animals with backbones, almost all living vertebrates fall into two groups. We have the cartilaginous fishes in purple. These are sharks, rays and chimeras, and there are around a thousand living species of them. And then the bony fishes. Bony fishes have a, a really vast modern diversity of around 60,000 living species. And this can fall, and this can split nearly equally into two groups. The ray finned fishes in green, and these are essentially things that you'd see in an aquarium or on a dinner plate. So things like trout and seahorses and flatfish. And then the lobe finned fishes in blue. 
And this includes fish like coelacanths and lungfish, but also all land dwelling vertebrates. So frogs, lizards, birds, dinosaurs, mammals, including ourselves. And my research uh, encompasses multiple vertebrate groups, um, but with a particular focus on, on the raffined fishes and the origin of, of bony fish and jawed vertebrates. So in my work, I want to better understand the relationship between living and extinct groups of vertebrates and then use this as a framework to, to answer a series of outstanding questions. So some of the questions that I'm going to cover today are um, trying to understand the origin of major features of the skeleton, which allows us to understand and constrain the appearance of key uh, innovations. Um, the relationships between living and fossils uh, and when living lineages evolved. And finally, to try and answer how, or to try and identify how raffin and fishes shaped what, and were uh, survived and were kind of um, formed by the many environmental perturbations that have punctured their history. And this won't be uh, news to many of you in the, system, uh, in the Systematics Association, but uh, as a kind of primer, we try and understand the relationships between living groups and draw these on a tree. And many, of, many people now use molecular evidence where you look at uh, DNA and this tells us the, the different uh, relationships between different vertebrate groups. So they give us this framework. We have uh, raffin fish and lobefin fish most closely related to each other. These are united as the bony fishes. And then the cartilaginous fishes are the closest living um, vertebrate, are the closest living uh, relatives to the bony fishes. And together, these three groups make up the jawed vertebrates, so named because they all have jaws, in contrast to the jawless vertebrates. And these groups are named for their skeletons. So cartilaginous fishes have a skeleton made of cartilage and bony fish have a skeleton made of bone. And we'll talk about these a little bit later on in the talk. The fossil evidence tells us that these two main groups of jawed vertebrates, the cartilaginous and bony fishes, um, separated over 425 million years ago in a geological time period called the Silurian. So this means that fossils are incredibly important for understanding how different early vertebrates are related to each other. But this is where we run into our first problem. Um, I've already explained that, you know, most people will use molecular evidence nowadays, but what happens when we add in fossils? Well, we've added in two fossil groups here. We've got a, a placoderm, which is the, the first uh, animals to evolve jaws, and then acanthodians, known as the spiny sharks. And molecular data isn't available for these groups, despite what something like Jurassic World would have you believe. So we have to build our understanding by observing uh, the anatomy of each of these animals and breaking it down into discrete characters, then assessing the distribution of those characters across the tree. So as a fairly crude example, we could ask whether a limb such as our arm, which has got a single articulation point between our shoulder, um, we can ask whether an arm or a limb is present. So we have our list of taxa and we assemble our morphological details. And we can see from this group, um, Placoderms, sharks, acanthodians, and then uh, raffined fish do not have uh, a, a shoulder girdle. They've got multiple articulation points with their shoulder. Sorry, they don't have a limb. They have multiple articulation points with uh, the shoulder girdle. But then the coelacanth and the orangutan do have a single articulation. Um, these have, things have a limb. And in fact, that's one of the characters that supports a close relationship between primates and coelacanths to the exclusion of everything else on this screen. So in fact, they're united in a group called the, low fin the lobe finned fishes. And this process of identifying characters is repeated for hundreds of, hundreds of taxa and hundreds of characters. And the resultant data matrix is analyzed to build up a, a comprehensive picture of relationships. We can repeat this for lots of characters and lots of taxa and work out how all the living and fossil groups are related. But this is where we run into our second problem. Much of the most informative uh, anatomy for, for reconstructing relationships is internal and therefore hard to access. So part of this is because vertebrates have two skeletons. We have an external skeleton and an internal skeleton. And many of the major innovations that drove vertebrate success are tied up in the brain case. This is a, essentially a kind of bony box that sits inside the skull and houses the brain and the sensory organs. And it's really anatomically complex and all vertebrates have one. So you can compare it across different groups and use it to, to reconstruct relationships. But because it's part of the internal skeleton, it's covered in um, layers of skin and muscle and bone. And in fossils, it's also covered by rock. So how do we get at it? 
Historically, people uh, would get at the inside of fossils using something called Solace's grinding machine. This is uh, invented in the early 1900s. You essentially take your fossil, you put it in a block of plastic, and then you grind away a quarter of a millimeter at a time. Each time you grind away, you take it off, you draw a picture of it, and then you repeat this until you have a pile of pictures, which you turn into wax plates and stick together. And then you have a kind of pile of dust where your fossil used to be. And this is an amazing technique that was really important for, for understanding the internal structure. But nowadays, museum curators don't really allow you to do this. They don't like you grinding their precious fossils into dust. So I use CT scanning instead. And here we use x-rays to unlock the internal anatomy of fossils. And because x-rays, um, because different materials uh, attenuate x-rays differently, we can exploit this to understand the, the difference between internal structures without having to cut into it. And it's exactly the same principle as getting an x-ray at a hospital. So the x-rays go right through your skin, uh, but you, they, you see your bones, your bones attenuate the x-rays more. So we take our fossil, we put it in a CT scanner, and then we can uh, reconstruct these slices to build up a, a three-dimensional picture of the anatomy. So here's an example. Um, this is a, a, a slice through a specimen. You can see all of these different colors are basically little bits of the, the skeleton that are inside this rock. Here's an example uh, for anyone who uh, isn't familiar with fish anatomy. Uh, you should be able to see the eye and the teeth to give you an idea. But we go through and we segment out each of these pieces of anatomy and we can end up with a, a complex 3D model that we can manipulate and 3D print and look at the internal previously inaccessible anatomy. Um, so I've shown you how these amazing techniques work and now I'm going to talk a bit about how I apply them to my research. So as I said, I look at early vertebrate uh, relationships and principally I'm interested in how living and fossil groups are related to each other. Um, and from this, it allows me to, to talk about character evolution and, and major innovations. And the first question I'm going to consider today concerns the origin of jawed vertebrates. So the point at which bony vertebrates and cartilaginous vertebrates separated from each other. Here we have that diagram that we saw earlier. Um, and we have bony and cartilaginous fish separating from a shared common ancestor over 420 million years ago. And because cartilaginous fish has stayed in the water and there are fewer species of them, whereas, you know, bony fish moved onto land and, and some of them diversified into humans, there's a, a kind of tendency to view cartilaginous fishes as somehow primitive or less evolved. And often there's a, an assumption that they retain this kind of ancestral morphotype that, you know, cartilaginous fishes are what the, the last common ancestor of all jawed vertebrates look like. We talked a little bit about the names of these groups and how they're named for their respectively cartilaginous and bony skeletons. And vertebrates, as I said, typically have two skeletons. So we have our external skeleton. Um, this is uh, made of, of dermal bone. And these are typically the, the, the plates and scales that, that cover the outside of, of, our, of our skeleton. We as humans have very little of a dermal skeleton left. We've got our teeth and then some bones and our skull. And then you've got the internal skeleton. And this is uh, made of, this is things like the brain case, the gill skeleton, the um, limbs, the axial column, things like that. And this may or may not be mineralized, which has major implications for fossilization. So unmineralized uh, internal skeleton made of cartilage doesn't fossilize. We can have a quick spin and look at what these look like in fossils. So the dermal skeleton shown on the left here is fairly um, un uncontroversial, it's very easy to interpret. You have layers of bone and enamel, dermal bone and enamel, they're quite easy to see. But the internal skeleton is much more complex. So originally in kind of ontogeny, uh, it's, cart it's made of cartilage. And that cartilage uh, is kind of <clears throat> coated in something called perichondral bone. And the earliest jawed vertebrates uh, didn't mineralize their cartilage, but they covered the um, skeleton in, in this thing called perichondral bone. So here's a, an example here where you have this kind of shell around the outside, but there's nothing mineralized internally. Chondrichthians do something, and cartilaginous vertebrates do something slightly different. They uh, calcify their cartilage, so it does fossilize. You do see it in fossils. And then bony vertebrates do something different still. So they replace most of their cartilage with 
endochondral bone throughout entogeny. So you end up with this uh, endochondral bone making up the internal skeleton. What does this look like in a phylogenetic context? So we have jawless and early jawed fishes seem to lack endochondral bone. Um, cartilaginous fishes again lack endochondral bone, they have calcified cartilage. And then bony fishes, bony fishes possess endochondral bone. And that implies that cartilaginous fishes primitively lacked bone and bony fish were the first to evolve endochondral bone. This kind of feeds into this narrative we touched on earlier about chondrixians being primitive. And my colleague um, Martin Brazeau at Imperial uh, has been interested in, in questions like this for a while and he ran a series of field expeditions to Western Mongolia to look at um, early Devonian rocks. I was lucky enough to, to attend one year and we found a, a really cool uh, locality in west, the far west of the country, um, but the fossils were really challenging to work with. So there's a, a kind of picture down here and this slightly kind of um, challenging hole this is the fossil essentially. And what has happened, I'm going to talk about this one particular specimen, during fossilization the bone has been partially um, dissolved away, so you end up with this mould, this cavity in the rock. And that's really challenging to work with because it's very difficult to, to know what it looks like. But here's where uh, CT scanning kind of comes into its own. So we CT scan this block, and we were able to, to reconstruct what was inside of this void and there was some bone kind of buried deep down inside. And we found that um, this is actually the skull of, of uh, a new kind of what's called a placoderm fish, so one of these earliest fossils with jaws. Um, so we can show you a, a nice model here of the anatomy um, and the kind of um, stuff in blue is the, the dermal bone, the skull roof. The stuff in this kind of uh, goldish colour is the is the um, the brain case, the internal skeleton, and then the stuff that's grey is mould. So that's where the, the the fossil has dissolved away. And we can also infill the brain case uh, to fill out to get what's called an endocast. This is an internal cavity, um, which is basically where the brain would have sat. Just to orient you a bit, uh, this is the the top of the skull. And this is the bottom of the skull. Uh, this is the, the kind of neck, essentially. We don't have the rest of the body of the specimen. Here are the eyes and then the nose is, is up here. And when we try and work out where in our evolutionary tree this goes, we fill out our data matrix and it pops out here. So it's kind of expected. It looks like a placoderm. It falls out near other placoderms. But what's really expected, what's really unexpected, sorry, is when we look at the tissues that make up its skeleton. So we'd expect this animal to have a skeleton made of cartilage, so essentially an internal skeleton that doesn't fossilize. But that's not what we see. When we take a look, these are sections through the, the brain case in different orientations, we see this very kind of peculiar spongy mineralization within the brain case. And it turns out actually this is very similar to what you see in, in bony fishes, this kind of spongy texture. It's very, very different to what we see in cartilaginous fishes. So this is very unexpected when we saw it, and we have to think about why this is important. Well, it has major implications for how we think that bone and skeletons evolved. So here's our kind of phylogenetic tree. We, we pop it in down here, we'd expect it to, to have no bone. Um, but what this fossil implies is that rather than um, cartilage being primitively present and only being present, in, sorry, an um, endochondral bone only being present in bony fish, it looks very much like bone, endochondral bone evolved a lot earlier than we previously thought, rather than it being specialized to this group of bony fishes. And what that implies is that cartilaginous fishes, rather than being primitive for not having it, are actually quite specialised because they primitively had the ability to form endochondral bone and they secondarily lost it. And it's not really clear why this happened. Um, endochondral bone is, is very physiologically expensive to produce. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of nutrients. So it might be that in losing uh, bone, they were able to be uh, more hydrodynamic. They were able to kind of expand um, and swim further. Um, but it's a really uh, interesting thing to, to look into and try and figure out why they had this ability to, to form bone primitively and have secondarily lost it. So, so far I've been talking about um, the origin of, of jawed vertebrates, so the point at which cartilaginous and bony fishes separated. 
But next, I want to talk a bit about how we integrate the, the living and fossil fish records to understand when living lineages evolved. And for the rest of the talk now, I'm going to focus in on ray-finned fishes. So I'll have a look at their relationships a little bit more closely. Relationships between living ray finned fishes are pretty well known. This is supported by both molecular and morphological data. And there are a number of uh, living groups, but the two main ones that we want to focus on are the polypterids and the actinopterans. Um, and actinopterans include all other ray finned fish that aren't polypterids. And there's a huge imbalance in, in species diversity and species richness. The vast, vast majority of ray finned fishes are actinopterans, specifically teleosts. So these are all of the things that um, you think of when you when you go to an aquarium or uh, go to a, a fishmonger. So things like trout and herring and seahorses and all of that kind of thing. But this means that um, non-teleost ray finned fishes have often been quite neglected in debates about relationships. And seeing as teleost evolved significantly later than the rest of than you know ray finned fishes as a whole, um, it means that a whole chunk of ray finned fish history is being neglected. And these earliest ray finned fishes, uh, those that are older than about 250 million years old, have often been particularly poorly studied. And this makes it very difficult to know when different living groups evolved. The split between the, the living uh, groups is known as the crown nodes. So this is the point at which all the living lineages evolved. And as I said, we have quite a poor handle on this. But this is a really big problem because accurate timescales are absolutely vital for understanding everything from rates of gene mutation to rates of extinction. You need to know when things evolve so you can work out how quickly or slowly they've been evolving since that point. So how do we figure out the age of the crown node? There are two main ways. We can use rocks where we look at fossils or we can use clocks where we look at molecular data. So the first of those, the, 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 um, the rock option, if you want, is to look at um, analyses of relationships between different animals and essentially pick out the oldest fossil that we think is related to the living groups. So in, in this case, the oldest fossil thought to be within the crown, uh, thought to be related to a living member, is about 384 million years old. And this indicates that living groups must have split at least 384 million years ago. But if we look at molecular data, if we look at clocks, we get a, a much, much wider range. So we get anything from an age of about 300 million years to well over 400 million years. And there are you know, a few factors that explain this incongruity. Partly it's because different molecular studies are using different sampling methods to tackle this problem. But a major reason is to do with there being a very poor fossil record for, for most of these living groups. And that's important because even though molecular data seems like it's independent of fossils, fossils are actually used to calibrate different nodes. So they're used to kind of act as a, a, a hard bound and say, we know that a group must have evolved by this point because we have a fossil member of it. And what's really, really striking about this is that polypterids uh, only have a fossil record. So polypterids are this group here that we mentioned before. They only have a, a fossil record going back about 100 million years. And this is important because as the oldest diverging living group, its origins must be at least as old as the rest of the crown group. But given that the oldest fossil um, associated with the, the living polyptera group is 100 million years old, and the oldest fossil associated with any living group is 384 million years old, it means that this one group has a quarter of a billion year ghost lineage. So this is a, a period of time where we'd expect to see fossils in the record, but we don't see anything. So, I, we, were, we were really interested in, in trying to tackle this problem and as part of a kind of broader um, campaign of understanding um, the skull anatomy in, in early fossil fishes, uh, we CT scanned this particular animal here. Um, it's from uh, the early Triassic of China, it's about 250 million years old. It was named in 2010 and then redescribed in, in 2014. And we CT scanned it because uh, it's preserved in 3D and it looked as though it might have um, bits of the internal skeleton preserved. So CT scanning is really vital for having a look at that internal anatomy. 
And sure enough, we used uh, CT scanning to build up this internal picture, this picture of its anatomy. So uh, I won't go into the, the gory details of all the, an of all the anatomy of this fossil, although I'd very much like to. Um, but to give you a kind of overview, uh, stuff that's in blue is uh, the, the dermal skeleton, the external skeleton. So we've got things like the, the jaw here, you should be able to see these teeth. Um, things in green are the hyoid arch. So this bone here is the hyomandibular. Things in purple are the brain case. So here, this is, you know, it's not complete in this animal, but it would have housed the brain. And then things in yellow are the gill skeleton. And as we were going through and having a look at this animal, we found out some really surprising similarity between this fossil and between polypterids, that, that early group, that early um, diverging group. Um, again, I won't go into too much anatomical details, but there are, there are features of the brain case, there are features of the um, lower jaw, and there are features of the gill skeleton that provide a fairly kind of compelling argument that these, this living and this fossil group are very closely related. So it's not enough to just note these similarities. We did a formal phylogenetic analysis to test these. And we uh, also included some molecular data. So we looked at it um, both through, a, 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 as I said, a, a, um, a, a morphological data analysis with 92 taxa and 260 odd characters. And we also added in uh, nuclear genes for 12 living animals that we included in the analysis. And we analysed it under both parsimony and Bayesian methods. And all of our results provided strong um, evidence that uh, this fossil is a fossil member of the polypterid total group. So if you remember, previously we thought that polypterids had this quarter of a billion year ghost lineage, but uh, with this kind of missing fossil record. And our work kind of fills in a big chunk of that gap. So we extend the fossil record back to 250 million years, filling in 150 million years of that ghost lineage. But beyond that, this finding has implications for the um, raffin fish, for the, for the age of the raffin fish crown. So here's our past hypothesis of the age of the crown node. Um, fossils suggest that it's about 384 million years old, and molecular data has anything from 300 to 430 million years. In our analysis, the oldest fossil related to living radiations is 339 million years old. So our results suggest that the crown is some 50 million years younger than, pre than in previous analyses based on um, based on fossil evidence. And when we use molecular data to estimate the age of the Raffin fish crown node, we get an age of 359 million years. So this is some 30 million years younger than the previous estimate. So this shows the kind of power that a single fossil essentially can have in, in radically revising not only relationships, but also the molecular ages of, of different radiations. Um, so while it's nice to think that molecular data is this kind of very uh, standalone method that is much more robust than using the horrible fossil record. We do need those horrible fossils to act as, as calibration points and to, to really pinpoint key nodes. Um, so sadly, we do have to keep looking at these, these awful fossils to try and uh, buttress some of the molecular data. But the other really interesting thing about this new age of 359 million years is that it brings the age of the Raffin fish crown in line with the end Devonian, in line with the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. And this is really interesting for something that I'm going to go on and, and finish, in, uh, finish the rest of the talk with. But um, it's kind of implying that uh, the, you know, this revised phylogenetic matrix where we integrate living and fossil taxa and we get new anatomy from uh, CT data it has the potential to not only tell us about the pattern, uh, to not only tell us about the timing and pattern of raffin fish evolution, but also to look at kind of major um, perturbations and how uh, relationships and evolution was affected by them in geological time. So this leads on to my, my next, the next phase of my research, uh, which is driven by this, as I said, um, aim of investigating broader patterns of raffin fish diversity and evolution. And the final thing I'm going to talk to you about today is um, quite preliminary work looking at uh, the initial diversification of the raffin fishes. So as well as um, potentially being the origin of the living radiation, the end Devonian marks this kind of really profound shift in raffin fish evolution. Devonian 
biologically conservative. So they essentially look like a standard fish shape. Some of them are a bit small, some of them are a bit bigger, but they tend to be fairly kind of similar, similar body shapes with some variation in size. And we only have around 20 to 30 known species from the whole of the Devonian. But in the Carboniferous, they're much more diverse and much more disparate. So there are around 300 known species and they're long-bodied, short-bodied, deep-bodied, wide-bodied and everything in between. Um, you've got some with kind of spines, you've got some with uh, kind of very large fins, you've got some with uh, beaks, some with kind of durophagus um, shell-crushing dentition. And this really sets the stage for their, for ray finned fish's future domination of the seas. And punctuating these two time periods is one of the big five mass extinctions, the end Devonian mass extinction. And this is where 50% of life went extinct. And the effect of this mass extinction on reef and fishes is, is quite poorly understood. It's been suggested everything from there was almost no impact to there was a really severe impact. But no matter what the impact was, it's clear that there's this major diversification happening in the Carboniferous. We can think about patterns of uh, relationships uh, relating to diversification by plotting them on a, a timescale tree where the nodes and branches are set against evolutionary time. So here I've got the geological column on the bottom of the screen. Our mass extinction um, at 359 million years is marked by this vertical red line. The next slide I'm going to put up has got a lot of information on it, so don't worry about it. I'll talk you through the key points. But this is what happens when we add in our, our tree. So we have this classic interpretation of ray finned fish evolution, where you have a small number of taxa in the Devonian, a larger number of taxa in the Carboniferous. It's also worth pointing out at this point that um, a huge number of taxa aren't included in this tree at all. And that's what um, my work is currently doing, is trying to fill in a bit of this gap. But essentially we have a very small number of lineages um, making it through the end Devonian. And this, in this particular tree, uh, it, it's reconstructed that just a single lineage made it through the Endivonian mass extinction. And the implication of this is that ray finned fishes were hit incredibly hard by this extinction event and that all of the diversification happened in the Carboniferous. And as hy hypotheses go, this is quite attractive. It mirrors lots of other narratives about there being a single kind of plucky survivor that's made it through this crisis and then succeeded in a post-extinction world. And it also shares narratives with some other, um, with, it shares some similarities with narratives inferred for other groups where you've got, for example, uh, the radiation of mammals after non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. But it's not really that simple. And one possibility is that our interpretations are being biased by missing data. So we know a huge amount of stuff, uh, we know a huge amount of anatomical information for animals that were alive about 50 million years before this mass extinction event, but very little about the animals that were alive immediately before it. And those fossils do exist. So here's one example. It was described by Eastman in 1907, but it uh, was described then and then sort of historically overlooked. Um, here's a, a kind of photo of the specimen itself. In case you're having a hard time orienting yourself, I'm not surprised, but basically you might be able to make out these rows of scales here, which is what you'd see in a typical fish. And then the head sort of disappears under this block of stone. Um, this entire fossil is very, very small. So here's the scale bar. The whole thing is maybe six or seven centimeters long. And it's known from pretty much right before the end Devonian mass extinction. This small size is a challenge, and this is where CT scanning really comes into its own. So we can take this block of, of, of stone, we can put it in a CT scanner, and we start to see these kind of really tantalizing uh, suggestions of anatomy within the block. And when we reconstruct that in three dimensions, we get this absolutely beautiful uh, head that suddenly pops out. So here's the, the orbit. This would be the, the nose of the fish. This is the upper jaw and then the lower jaw here. And this is the back of the neck. And again, we can have a look at the anatomy in three dimensions. But what's really, really striking is that this head is, is about five millimeters across. So it's the size of you know, your little fingernail, essentially. And it's got all of this anatomical information kind of tied up inside it. But without CT scanning, without the ability to, to look at, to kind of, I guess, blow up these, these details, it's pretty much completely inaccessible.
Again, I'm not going to go too much into the anatomical details, uh, but it turns out that this fossil has got really unusual anatomy for a Devonian fossil fish. Um, the kind of key points, uh, so on the, the left here in the next few slides, we've got our, our specimen from the late Devonian. This is what a typical Devonian fish looks like, and then this is what a typical Carboniferous fish looks like. So the first example, which is circled in red, is uh, these bones called suborbitals. These are present behind the eye, behind the orbit. They tend to be absent in Devonian fish, but they're present in Carboniferous fish, and surprisingly our Devonian fish has them. Another example is uh, found in the internal skeleton in the brain case. And this is a, a ventral view of the brain case. And there's this hole here, which would have been for the, the aorta uh, at the bottom that, that provided um, blood for, for the brain case in the brain. Devonian fossils don't tend to have this hole, but Carboniferous fossils do. And again, our fossil has this, has this hole, has this foramen. The final example is um, a bone called the hyomandibula. In Devonian fossils, you have a dermal bone, which is fused to it. And in Carboniferous fossils, the bone is not fused to it. And again, in our Devonian fish, surprisingly, the higher mandibula is not fused. So what happens when we run a phylogenetic analysis to, to look at the relationships of this fossil and what the implications are for basically a bunch of features that we thought were restricted to the Carboniferous appearing in the Devonian? Well, here's our old hypothesis. So this is uh, similar to what I showed you before. It's our traditional hypothesis where you just have this single lineage essentially making it across the, the boundary and then all this diversification happening in the Carboniferous. But when we add in a lot of the, uh, when we add in these very small latest Devonian taxa that have historically been excluded, we get a really, really different picture. And the picture we get is of multiple lineages you know, very, very many lineages making it through the Endivonian mass extinction. And this indicates that you've got what's called cryptic diversification happening. So all the lineages split before the mass extinction, but they don't really diversify into all of the different groups and all of the different anatomy until after that extinction event. This has really big ramifications for our understanding of how badly raven fishes were affected by the seemingly catastrophic, catastrophic event, as well as for rates of extinction and diversification. Um, some of the, my, my kind of ongoing work at the moment is investigating these patterns in a bit more detail. But what's kind of quite interesting is that these late Devonian fossils, uh, which have historically been overlooked, are actually out there. They just haven't been paid that much attention. So this is um, uh, uh, the, the upper jaw, the maxilla of a, a ray-finned fish from the Fermenian of Turkey, which again was described in 1984, so over 30 years ago. And again, since then has not really been looked at. So it's not so much that the fossils aren't there, it's that the fossils have been, um, need a bit more focus and the impact of these specimens once properly described is potentially huge. So, We've been on a bit of a wild ride through several hundred million years of evolution covering uh, thousands of animals. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up with a, a short summary. So we've heard about uh, reef and fishes and how they account for 50% of all living vertebrates. There's this fantastic technique called uh, CT scanning, 3D X-ray imaging, which allows us to, to look at the internal anatomy of these specimens and shed new light onto to old problems of uh, anatomy, relationships and evolution. And we need to do this so that we can put together a robust hypothesis of relationships. Once we have that, we can look at macroevolutionary patterns. So we can look at um, the impact of mass extinctions, we can look at rates of evolution, we can look at uh, rates of diversification, but none of that is possible without having that hypothesis of relationships in place. And one of the reasons why reef and fishes are perfect for um, looking at this is because they have such a long evolutionary history. So we've talked about how they evolved nearly half a billion years ago. And since then, they've um, survived through all of the big, uh, sorry, at least four of the big five mass extinctions. And in some cases, have been very badly affected. In some cases, seem to have sailed through. But they're a really uh, perfect test case for having a look at long-term patterns of evolution. But we need that hypothesis of relationships, which comes from the anatomy before we can figure it out. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Uh, hold on a minute. Great, thank thank you, Sam. That that was that was really really interesting. Um, please, there, there there must be some. I, I have a bunch of questions, but there must be some some question. If you could stick them in this oh, one straight away. Here we go. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to read this question it's from, from from Gavin. As somebody who knows nothing much about fossil fish, do we do we have sort of equivalent fossil records of freshwater and marine fishes over time? Are we potentially missing some lineages? Polypterids, e.g. polypterids, because those habitats are poorly represented, or do modern habitat preferences of, for instance, polypterids tell us very little about how older lineages would have existed? Yeah, it's a really yeah. good question. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Principally, we don't know very much about the equivalent fossil records of, of marine and freshwater fish over time because people haven't looked at it in huge amounts of detail, particularly for, for the really old radiations. So I have a, a student at the moment, Struan Henderson, who's looking at exactly this and trying to understand um, deep patterns of diversification in, in different environments. But to do that requires you getting all of the data together, which hasn't historically been compiled. Um, but it's interesting when you look at the, the, a lot of the modern lineages and a lot of modern fish diversity is freshwater. Um, but when you go back, they've actually got, you know, many of them were marine in origin and lived in marine and freshwater environments um, throughout much of their history. But it's only today, quite recently, that they've been restricted to these freshwater environments. Great. Thank you, Sam. I've got a second, second another question here. Um, uh, it says, great talk, thanks. Can I ask if cyclostomes, that's lampreys and hagfishes, I assume, uh, were used in the analysis, phylogenetic and dating? They weren't, and the principal reason for that is that um, it's a bit unclear how, so we have uh, most of vertebrate diversity is, is jawed vertebrate. So 99.9% .9 of vertebrate diversity is either chondrichthians or, or bony fishes. Then we have the jawless fishes, which most people have never even come across, but these are the, the lampreys and hagfish known as cyclostomes. Um, it's very unclear what these things evolve from. They look very primitive. They've got, you know, they don't have bone, they don't really have, uh, they don't have jaws, they've got very strange gill skeletons, they don't, they have very rudimentary eyes, and it's quite unclear what they evolve from and whether they, they look primitive because they are primitive or if they've secondarily lost various features. So they weren't included in these analyses because it's very difficult to disentangle things that have a you know a 600 million year history and put the living ones in and hope that they're representative of, of the fossil members. So we didn't include them in, in these. With the, um, the, the first example that I talked about, the um, bone evolution, uh, we used extinct jawless fishes like Galeaspids and Otiostracans as, as our jawed, as our jawless fish examples because they the timing is is a bit closer so we feel like they are perhaps a bit more representative of, of what jawless fish looked like back in the the Silurian or the Ordovician. Great, right, thank you. Um, okay, I, I, I want to ask one of one of my I've got a number of questions. I want to ask one of mine, um, and it may just be based in ignorance, but you you. you, you Obviously, you spoke about molecules. You spoke about uh, the fossils, but you didn't speak about developmental biology. My primitive understanding is that it was always cartilage to bone. Yeah. So in um, in ontogeny, that's what's happened. So you have well, it's made complicated by the fact that you have dermal bone and endochondral bone, and dermal bone. Uh, so cartilage seems to have evolved first, and then dermal bone evolved, and it's unclear at what point endochondral bone evolved. So it seems like endochondral bone, uh, you know, people thought that endochondral bone was was restricted to bony fish um, and was never present in cartilaginous fish. But there seems to be some evidence uh, coming out of some really cool labs that, um, you know, it, it kind of the genetic evidence backs up our fossil evidence, which is that cartilaginous fishes maybe do have the ability to form endochondral bone, but they've lost it. Which is really cool because that's what these fossils seem to imply. But yeah, developmentally, uh, cartilage forms first, and then the cartilage is kind of replaced by endochondral bone. But it, it, it seems as though uh, chondrichthians have lost that ability rather than kind of never evolved that ability. All right, so it's not, 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 not some form of recapitulation then. 
No, it doesn't seem to be, but it's a it's a bit um again, it's you know, it, it's unclear how much the kind of phylogeny is matching the the development essentially. Mm. Um, let me see if there's oh, there's one other, there's one other quick but let, can I just ask just just before before I get this one I just want to another a really practical one um, where does most of your, do you find most of this material in museums or in field collections I saw the the, the paper from Jean Vier in eighteen four that's and you said these things are still kicking around that's really interesting so are our museums stuff full of things that are still worth looking at. Yeah, so I am primarily not a field geologist. I've done some field work like in Mongolia, but there are so many fossils in museums that were described, you know, decades ago and uh, but by people who didn't have access to CT scanning. So most of my work is basically looking through kind of, you know, really old monographs or books from the 1930s or 20s that are really hard to get hold of and going through and looking for specimens that I think Oh, it would be cool to CT scan that. So my kind of, um, most of the way that I operate is I'll uh, find a fossil or I'll go to a museum and rootle around in the basement for a few days and then come out with a, a bunch of things to CT scan. So yes, this week actually, uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week, I was back in the Natural History Museum for the first time since March, just had the best time, like looking through drawers and we looked at hundreds of fossils. Um, so yeah, most of the, the majority of stuff I do is on, um, stuff that has already been described but just based on um external anatomy so yeah uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that for all sorts of reasons um here's <laughs> another question it's, uh, it's from jonathan todd i'm interested in what your possible research constraints might be one number of specimens you would like to scan or two amount of time and effort required to scan and segment species and our additional part he's put here is which if any is more important yeah, so ideally you'd want to look at multiple specimens because um, then you can make sure that, uh, you know, it's not a one off and that the anatomy is representative of everything. But typically with, um, typically we don't have multiple, you know, it's, it's very common for a fossil to only be known from one specimen or if it's known from multiple specimens for most of them to be flat and only one to be 3D. So where possible, I'll try and look at, you know, I'll try and scan two or three specimens and, and check. That they're all consistent but it's not always possible. With uh, Fukangiklis, which was the the Chinese um, polypterid, there were two specimens that are 3D and we scanned them both and they were awful but we managed to, I managed to segment them. Um, yeah time and effort, so it can take anything, so the scanning itself can take anything from half an hour to the longest I've ever CT scanned something was three days uh, but it normally, you know, normally about six to 10 to 12 hours. In terms of segmenting, it typically takes a few weeks, uh, but the longest, it, it can take up to, you know, 18 months. I've, I've spent 18 months before segmenting yeah. something. So it really depends on, I guess, how, how important it is that you segment out everything. But I like to be very thorough. So it's possible that someone else might be a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, so it's getting that balance between making sure that um, really important specimens you can cross check and you can make sure are present in, in multiple animals if there are multiple fossils available. Great, thank you. Um, this, the, the, I've got nothing else sitting here. I'm, I'm gonna let you off the hook in a minute, but I, I just need to ask you ask one other question, which is, which is kind of slightly irritating me, but uh, it, it's an analytical question really. Um, you, you, you've, you put all those data together, did, did you try analysing them separately? Um, the reason why I ask is because you mentioned missing data and I looked at one of your matrices that they zip by and there's a lot of question marks in there and I, I think question marks are the bane of our life. So uh, did you try, yeah, did you try it, the data <laughs> separately? Yeah. Did you put more so there's yeah, so the, the, one of the frustrating things with, um, there is a huge amount of missing data. Uh, so you have missing data from fossils that we just don't have. So we have these huge ghost lineages. And then you also have missing data from, um, you know, maybe the fossil is incomplete or maybe it's not mineralized or maybe you couldn't segment it. Um, 
I have tried and I have a student working on this a bit at the moment, looking at the impact of, you know, only analyzing the brain case, only analyzing the dermal skeleton. It seems as though the more the better. So even if you, you know, it's better to include characters that have a lot of missing data than exclude them. Um, just because, um, I, you know, the more evidence, the better. And there is some evidence that the, the, the internal skeleton, which is missing in a lot more things, there's some evidence that that's a bit more conservative. So it evolves a bit more slowly. There are fewer reversals. So even though we don't have brain cases for most taxa, it's important to include those in the characters because it, it, it strengthens, you know, they're less homoplastic in a way. But it is very frustrating when I spend, you know, a solid week coding things. And most of the time I'm just typing in question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark or zero question mark, question mark, question mark. Sure, sure. I, th I think that might be the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pain of most of us. Um, I, I, I've probably got to wrap this up at seven, but I've just noticed one qu a really interesting question here that went into the chat instead of the, the, the questions. And uh, let, let, let me let me finish with this one. I think this is a really interesting one. It, it, they're, they've written here. Are there any 3D printers that can print out all the fine internal details of those fish fossils so that you could replicate it over and over without damaging the original specimen? As you said, many of these species are known from just one specimen. Yeah, so that's the exact uh, amazing gap to the beginning. Um, I'm just going to get here. This is my favourite uh, thing. So it's the 3D print of a skull oh, yeah. and the okay. brain, the brain cavity, and you can see. I mean, this thing down at the bottom. This is a, a, a blood vessel. This sort of kind of gone into the mouth from from the brain case. You can see the the inner ear. So these are the organs of hearing and balance. And then the brain case, you've got all of these foramina in the orbit for, for the different blood vessels and nerves. So it's fantastic. And, you know, the, this uh, serial sectioning that I talked about, people made these beautiful, detailed, three-dimensional wax models, but they're now falling apart. You can't study them because they're so fragile and the wax is distorted over time. Um, the original specimen isn't there anymore. You only have the wax model left and the, the drawings. So what we're trying to do with some specimens is to... Um, basically CT scan the drawings and then use that to build up uh, a digital version of the wax model. Because uh, as you say, it can, um, you know, you can make it, I mean, this specimen is this big in life. So you can blow it up, you can kind of pass it around to school children, you can take it into yeah. lectures yeah. and practicals and hang it out to, hand it out to people in your, in your lecture theatre. So yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. And the resolution is amazing. You can resolve things that are, a tenth or a hundredth of a millimeter in size so yeah they're really really good yeah it's, it's absolutely fantastic so I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna let you let you try and enjoy the rest of your evening without having to be on, on the spot here uh, that was that was really enjoyable i mean from the pers my, my perspective uh, from, from, from taking you'll forgive me for this expression but taking a bit of old rock and then Shang, there's actually a fish in there. It's just, um, I, I, I'm, I'm continually amazed by it. I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. Um, we can't even applaud, can we, or anything, but uh, um, we owe you something or other. I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks Karen, very much for your my, my, my absolute pleasure. Karen, I, I keep relying on you to say this thing's closed. Yes, whenever you're ready. I, thank you very oh. much to Sam for that amazing presentation. It was uh, really nice and very thought-provoking and very easy to follow, especially for people who, like me, for example, I'm not a paleontologist, but <laughs> it was very nice and interesting to follow. Great, Great. thank you. Yeah, and thanks very much. And hopefully at some point we can, uh, yeah, see, see yeah. each other in the future. But uh, yeah. It would be lovely if we could someday meet again in person. <laughs> yeah, that would be very good. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. I can hear my kids screaming downstairs. Right. So I'm oh. gonna see what's going on. Thank you so well, much for you, for giving this amazing lecture. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you.